complex. No, I don't think we understand consciousness yet. And I'll give you some blunt evidence of it. Mm -hmm. We have DNA in common. And there's so many people who want to say we are special because we're different. But I have a different, I, I, I say we are special because we are the same. I want to celebrate being alive an interesting challenge. We surely would have considered ancient Rome a civilization of intelligent people. But had aliens tried to send radio waves to them, no way to receive it, no way to send back, no way to even know what a radio wave is, because the technology had not yet been invented. So our definition of are we alone has to include that they are not only intelligent, but have technology that they can invoke to then send signals across the galaxy. So here's my concern. There was an attempt to communicate with us before we had radio waves, and they concluded that there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. Suppose not only that, they figured out a cleverer way to communicate than radio waves and radio telescopes. A way that we have yet to invent, because we've only been at it for 70 years. They would still come back with no signal from us. It's hubristic to even think that what we invent out of the human mind would be the way they would attempt to communicate with us. Just of how long the universe has been around, how many stars there are in the galaxy, and how many galaxies there are in the universe, and how common the ingredients of life are in the universe. We're not made of rare stuff. You know, if we were made of like a, an isotope of business, then you could argue that this is a rare thing we got going here on Earth, and it's precious, let's not take it for granted. But we're made of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, and this is like the most common ingredients in the universe. And if biology as an inevitable trajectory of the experimentation that happens naturally on planetary surfaces, then maybe life is inevitable, but is intelligence as we define it inevitable? So these are fascinating questions that require that we relax the bias that we have as being humans on this planet, just to even ask the question in an answerable way, are we alone? Motivation for you. The human genome can combine in trillions of ways to make a human. How many humans have ever been born? Latest estimates, it's about 80 billion. Trillions is a way bigger number than 80 billion. One day, we're all gonna die. And it's sad when someone dies. Not enough of us spend time celebrating the fact that we were alive at all. You are lucky that you get to die. Most humans who could ever exist never will. And so the fact that you exist at all is against stupefying odds of who gets born and who does not. Realizing this, you are you, I am me. We are alive, we get to die. And to get to die means you get to live. Mm. Any moment you spend squandering those moments you are alive does disrespect to all those who will never even be born. I wanna celebrate being alive. Even if you are sick, even if you are terminal, you still got to live when trillions of people would never even be born. So live every one of those moments. What's the number? It's a third or two, it's about, I forgot the, the fraction. Around a half of all stars that have names in the night sky have Arabic names. Because in the golden age of Islam, a thousand years ago, navigation was a big deal. And they navigated using astrolabes. True. Astrolabes are gorgeous. They're works of art. They're brass, they're etched. There are different disks that you can replace depending on where you are on Earth to know where you are more accurately. Wow. This is all navigation. According to one theory, our universe is located inside of a black hole. If this is the case, where is our universe's singularity? Some equations relate to a black hole mm -hmm. apply to our entire universe, such as we have an event horizon. We, we have a horizon. Right, we do. It's analogous to event horizon of a black hole. If you look at the density of matter in the universe out to that event horizon, it is the density of matter you would need to make a black hole the size of our universe. Wow. But is it a black hole, okay? Right. And so if it is, then there ought to be a singularity somewhere, somewhere that we haven't seen, we, haven't we don't seen. know where it is. A whole new space time opens up inside the black hole. If you look back at us, the future history of the universe runs its course and a whole other space time opens up. So each black hole would contain a universe. A universe. But that universe is not sharing the space time of our universe. Right. So they're worried, will it fill up or bump in? No, in higher dimensions, you can fit everything. Right, and all, it, yeah, it doesn't make a difference. That, that's right. You have a sheet of paper that goes to infinity, two dimensions. If I go into a third dimension, I can have another sheet of paper that goes, goes to infinity, infinity and it does not intersect the first. Exactly. In fact, I can have an infinite, infinite number, number of, of infinite sheets of paper. One above the other. Correct. So when you 
add higher dimensions, you don't have to think or worry about, you know, stepping on each other's toes. It can happen. Right. You just, it's, it's not a thing. Here's what we do. We look up in the universe and we say, okay, there, we see galaxies. Hubble discovered that these fuzzy things in the night sky are entire galaxies, such as our Milky Way. Major discovery in 1926. And then in 1929, he discovers that these fuzzy things that we now identify as whole galaxies are hurtling away from one another. And this is the first evidence that the universe is expanding. People didn't just think this up. Oh, it must be, ex no, no, it was an observation. And then we looked to see if it fit Einstein's general theory of relativity, and it did. General theory of relativity is the modern understanding of gravity. And if anything's happening in the universe, it's gonna involve gravity. If the universe is bigger today than it was yesterday, that must mean it was bigger yesterday than it was the day before, and then the day before. So what happens if we just turn the clock back? When you do this, because you see how fast we're expanding. Just reverse that. You can do it on a pen and paper, on the back of an envelope. The fact that there are seashells on mountaintops had been for centuries invoked by devout religious, monotheistic religious people as evidence for Noah's flood. So the flood would have brought seashells to high places as the whole earth was covered. And then Leonardo da Vinci comes along and looks at these seashells and says, wait a minute, these seashells are perfectly laid out. It looks like they got fossilized in place in an orderly way. And if there's a catastrophic earthwide flood, nothing gets laid down orderly. He used the fact that the shells were orderly, not broken in their fossilized state at high altitude to suggest that maybe the land and the seas were at different elevations in Earth's history. And that was in the 1400s. So entropy can explain the evolution of the universe, life, and it's also said to be able to explain why time only runs forward. How, how does that work? If there's a process that can occur in one orientation, like an egg cracking on the floor, the laws of physics say that the reverse run film of the egg uncracking is compatible with the laws of physics. But then you ask yourself, why don't we ever see eggs uncrack? Why does time always go in one orientation? And it really comes right back to entropy. It's very easy for an order system to smash into disorder because there's so many ways to be disordered. It's very hard for the disordered system to come back together and yield an ordered system because there's so few configurations of the particles that will be ordered. So again, in a sense, entropy gives us an understanding of the asymmetry of time. We're going to do uh, an experiment of how far to this scale, if we're according to this scale, how far away the moon might be. Oh, sure. So okay. So I'll give you the somebody, moon. Yeah. Here, come here. Come here. Come here. Okay. You now have the moon. Put it where, you, where the moon is, relative, where Earth you, is the where size. Where do you think it is? <laughs> Given that this is 20 inches and this is five, you think the moon is? Right about there. That is way off. Just start backing up. Yeah, and me. Keep going, keep going. Turn, turn around while you're going. Keep going. That, that's about right, yeah. That's about the Earth-Moon distance. And then the positioning of Mars, which of course we're going to have to send. Oh yeah, okay. So, 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 so I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to really save you this effort here. Mars would be like out in like Town Lake. Town Lake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Space is empty. It's really empty. You know the people who say this is a universe made for us? No, it's not. Most of the universe is completely empty and you'd be dead within seconds if put there. And it's also true for Earth's surface. If I drop you butt naked in 70% of Earth's surface, uh, you're dead some minutes later because you'd freeze, you'd be mm -hmm. eaten. Most of Earth's surface is hostile and we create these environments so that we are comfortable to shield us from all the ways Earth wants to kill us. Show us where the International Space Station is, Hubble, et cetera. Where oh, okay, so if the Earth were actually mm -hmm. this, this size, the International mm -hmm. Space Thanks. Station would be orbiting about a half an inch above the surface. And that dude who jumped out of a perfectly good balloon, Felix Baumgartner, he would have been two millimeters above the surface of this globe. That's his edge of space jump. You use the energy just to live, to maintain your body temperature. Mm -hmm. Right now, the air is like 73 degrees in this room. <laughs> yeah. Your body temperature, if you're human, is 98 and a half degrees. Yeah. You are sustaining 26 degree temperature difference between your body and this air. That you are burning energy in this instant because if you died, then all that metabolism stops. What happens that instant? Your body begins to cool cools down to what temperature? It looks on its way towards air temperature. That's why if you go in a funeral parlor, mm -hmm. if there's an open casket and you're one of these people who actually touches the dead body, yeah. what's the first thing everybody says about it's it? Cold. It's cold. Yeah. It's actually not cold. It's the same temperature as the table, as uh. the chair, 
as the floor. It's the same thing. It's just that you're not accustomed to touching skin at table temperature. The price of college is expensive. Try the price of ignorance. Your kid goes in the refrigerator and pulls out an egg. What's the first th thing you do? You say, don't do that. It might break. No, no, let that one, let that one play out. There's the egg. Oh, this is solid. It's like start playing with it. Of course the egg is going to break onto the floor. You learn something about brittle, that something can be brittle. It can be hard, but not strong. So it breaks. It shatters. And then the stuff comes out the middle. Some is yellow and others has no color. And then you say, that was almost a chicken. And then you just blow the mind of the kid. Right? <laughs> and they say, wow, are there any chickens in the others? I want to find out. And what did that cost you? What does an egg cost? It's 20 cents. I know it's, you don't want to waste food, but it's the economic, it's 20 cents. No, I don't think we understand consciousness yet. And I'll give you some blunt evidence of it. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a bookstore and ask, where are your books on consciousness? They'll show you the shelf and it's like shelf after shelf after shelf and books still being published on that subject. You now say, well, where are your books on gravity? Well, it's like three books on one side of one shelf. Evidence that we don't understand something yet is that people keep publishing books saying that we understand it. When you understand something, the book gets written and then you move on to other topics. So we have Newton gravity and Einstein gravity. You get that in three or four books. No one is still trying to explain it. And by the way, this would be true for almost anything. Just look around. If active researchers are still publishing it, it means we know least about it. That tells me if we don't fully understand consciousness, yet there are people who fear AI becoming conscious. Uh, I don't see one falling from the other. <laughs> we're afraid it's gonna become this thing we don't fully understand yet because we're afraid of that, maybe. Like I said, we don't understand our own id in a way to think that just simply having a faster computer is gonna make an id in the computer. But we'll see. I remain fearless of AI. I, I say bring it on, just bring it. Bring it on. Life require liquid water. Maybe all it requires is liquid. On one of Saturn's moons, Titan, oh, it yes. is so cold yeah. that methane has liquefied and it has become lakes and rivers. There are meandering rivers and river deltas on um, Titan, Titan of running methane. And methane is chemically reactive just the way oxygen is. Mm -hmm. So now we imagine mm -hmm. life, life on Titan with methane as the fluid that is carrying nutrients from one mm -hmm. part of the creature mm -hmm. to another. And if that's the case, then this whole concept of a Goldilocks zone has to be revisited. While you are firing rockets, there is a force operating on you that you will not be able to distinguish from an ordinary gravitational force. Mm. This was deduced by Albert Einstein in what's called the equivalence principle, an accelerating rocket is indistinguishable from you sitting on Earth with Earth's acceleration of gravity. There's no experiment you can perform other than looking out the window to know if you're in a rocket or sitting here on Earth in a box. What's that movie that had moon pirates? Oh, Seriously? Oh, 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 that was called Ad Astra. Ad Astra. So they would show these rockets firing and you go inside the ship and they were all weightless. No. There's this misconception that exactly. being in space, space makes you late weightless. Wait, no, right, right. no. If you are drifting in space, as our space missions do, they're sent in motion and you're drifting towards the crossover point. You're weightless that entire time. But as long as you have on rockets, you are not weightless. You can calculate how much chemical energy is in your body. And that energy came from the fact that you ate food your whole life. People look up at night, many people feel small. That's understandable because in fact, you are small. We are small. We're not big, not only in space, but in time and size. There's very little that would otherwise distinguish us, except for our capacity to wonder, to be curious. Humans among all animals, especially mammals, are the only ones who are completely comfortable sleeping on our backs. We also sleep at night. Well, if you sleep on your back at night and you wake up, what are you looking at? The night sky, the lights in the void of darkness. It may be the universe intrigues us all when we look up at night and wonder, where did we come from? Where are we now? Where are we headed in the future? And the cosmic perspective is one where all of Earth is one because Though this be 20 inches across, with political boundaries identified, when actually viewed from space, it's just ocean, land, and atmosphere. From space, we are not compelled to divide ourselves because we occupy this lone, frail spaceship Earth. And when you are not compelled to divide yourself, there's the urge to say we're in this together. You know, you think of family, and you say, that's my family, but you're not in my family. Excuse me. The boundary between what is in family and what is not is completely culturally determined. It's cultural. Because any two of us in this room, if you go far enough back, the tree of life, have a common ancestor. So we could draw it that far back and say, we are family. 
You can keep going back and find the common ancestor with the rest of the apes, with dogs, with an oak tree. We have DNA in common. And there's so many people who want to say we are special because we're different. But I have a different, I, I, I say we are special because we are the same. Mm. We are part of this world where we have DNA in common with yeast, with oak trees, with the insects that scurry under brush. We have the same atoms that are in stars. So now you look up, it's we are common with the universe as well. So for me, the cosmic perspective reorders what is important in this world. And it does it in, I think, the noblest of ways by recognizing not what makes us all different, but what makes us all common together alone with the fate of our planet and our civilization in our hands. How much does a whale weigh? Well, a whale weighs nothing. It's neutrally buoyant swimming in the water. You have to ask how much mass does it have? It's why the biggest animals that ever existed exist in the water. They don't have to hold up their own weight against the gravity on Earth's surface. The whale is the biggest creature that ever existed in the history of life on Earth. Yet it can float. Because its density is about the same as water. If you are less than water, it would have to use energy to stay under underwater because the water would want to make it float. Following up on that, here's something interesting. Ready? Mm -hmm. You know who the smartest person in the world was? You raising your hand? No. <laughs> One of the most clever people in the world was the first person to figure out everything you make the ship out of is denser than water and it can float. You can build a ship out of steel and have it float. How do you get it to float? Because the part of the boat that sits below water is mostly air. The hull of the ship sits right. below water. So what matters is not that steel is heavier than water and air is lighter than water. It's what is the average density of that which you have plunked in the water. It's the total volume divided by the total mass. It has less mass than you think because most of it is air. An aircraft carrier, most of its volume is air. Here on Earth, we have a magnetic field. When dangerous charged particles come from the sun, we call it the solar wind, they see Earth's magnetic field and then they channel themselves away and funnel in at the poles. And they collide with our atmosphere and render it a glow, causing the aurora. So when we see the aurora, that's the atmosphere and our magnetic field shielding us from harmful radiation. If we lose our magnetic field, the radiation just comes straight in wherever it hits. Mm. Mars may have once had a magnetic field, it does not any longer. So if you pitch tent, you're susceptible to this flux of high energy particles. Will we just have underground colonies? Yeah. Almost anything will protect you from those particles, like the roof of a house. The shielding doesn't have to be elaborate, mm -hmm. it just has to have some kind of shielding. There's a whole branch of NASA that specializes in space weather, which is when is the solar wind coming? Because it correlates with explosions on the sun. Yeah. It's not just at any time. Yeah. So as the sun goes through cycles, it goes through uh, intense periods and then it a quiescent. It's an 11 year cycle. We know when when a pulse of these particles is going to hit us because it takes time to get from the sun to, to Earth or mm -hmm. to Mars. Mm -hmm. So we just have a, a warning sign. Yeah. Is that any different from saying thunderstorms this afternoon? Yeah.